Good afternoon everyone. Thank you so much for participating in today's webinar. We're going to get started just because we are mindful of time. So today's webinar is on psycho, psychosocial factors and musculoskeletal disorders using the evidence to inform risk management. The topic and expert speaker for this session is brought to you by the Office of Industrial Relations, which is comprised of the Electrical Safety Office, Workplace Health and Safety Queensland and the Workers' Compensation Regulator. Just to let you know, the Office of Industrial Relations is committed to driving initiatives across the whole scheme that improves safety, well-being and return to work outcomes for both employers and workers. Today's session is specifically an, an initiative of Workplace Health and Safety Queensland and it will provide you guys with an overview of current research evidence relating to the causes of MSDs including the impact of psychosocial hazards. Just to let you know who you're listening to, my name is Alicia Bailey and I'm the Manager of Engagement Services for the Workers' Compensation Regulator and I will be to the facilitator for today's session. Just before I introduce you to Dr. Jody Oakman, our presenter for today, I have just a few tips on how to make the most out of the webinar experience. Firstly, we are mindful of time, so we'll try to keep the webinar um, strictly to 45 minutes if we can. At the end of the presentation, there will be an opportunity for Jody to answer some of your questions, so we do really encourage that you make the most of this opportunity. So at any point throughout the webinar, if you do have a question, just use the chat box on the right hand side of the screen. We'll collate all your questions and then Jody will work through as many as she can, um, depending on time at the conclusion of the webinar. A copy of the webinar will also be emailed through to you um, at the conclusion of today's session and we will also make it available on the Work Safe Queensland website. So please feel free to share this resource with any of your networks that you feel may benefit from today's session. If at any time during today's session you do experience audio issues, please again use that chat box on the right hand side of the screen. We have our IT experts on hand to help you just to make sure that you don't miss out on any content. So please let us know. So now that's the housewarming done, so let's get straight into it. In this specific webinar, we have Dr. Jody Oakman, who's the Senior Lecturer at La Trobe University, and she'll present on some of the findings from research currently being undertaken at the uni to discuss potential, potential changes to the way that MSDs are managed. Dr. Oakman is a Senior Lecturer at the Centre for Ergonomics and Human Factors and a Postgraduate Coordinator for the Ergonomics, Safety and Health Program. Dr. Oakman has worked extensively in industry as a consultant in ergonomics to many organisations. She's a qualified physiotherapist. She also has a PhD in the area of the ageing workforce and the impact of organisations on their employee retirement intentions. Sorry about that, I'm choking on my own words. So that's all the formalities done. So now I will hand you over to Jody and she'll take you through today's session. Hello and welcome. Thank you for taking time to attend the session today. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the current um, evidence around uh, risk management of MSDs and I'm going to start with posing three key questions around are MSDs actually a problem? What does the evidence tell us about uh, musculoskeletal disorders? And are there gaps in the current strategies that we use to manage musculoskeletal disorders or MSDs? Okay, so firstly, what are MSDs? Many definitions around musculoskeletal disorders, but mostly there is consensus that they are, um, uh, they affect tendons, tendon sheaths, muscles, nerves, blood vessels. What's, uh, what's important in a workplace setting is that they are, um, co are there are complex issues um, and they develop over time or exposure to a single event. And this, I think, is one of the great challenges for us in the work environment, is that mostly we are encouraged to think about exposures to single events. But in reality, what happens is that things develop over time and the single event uh, may or may not be uh, a significant issue. So how do we know whether or not it's, a, uh, it's an, injury or a dis uh, an injury or a disorder? Um, I'm just assuming that people Right, that's okay, can hear me. Um, <clears throat> okay, 
So there are many diagnoses for uh, musculoskeletal disorders, but we know that the reliability of these diagnoses is often poor. Um, and we know that mostly they arise from exposure to a range of issues over time. Um, and in the workplace, unfortunately, much of our attention gets skewed towards the right of this diagram um, from an injury diagnosis uh, leading on to claim um, and then rehab, rather than to the left at the onset of symptoms. And so what, um, what we're suggesting is that much of our focus should be, uh, we should skew more of our focus in prevention activities towards the left, identifying when people uh, become symptomatic and not worrying so much about what the diagnosis is given um, the issues around the reliability of those. This may be important uh, in a clinical setting, but in a workplace setting, we really need to be uh, identifying uh, what are the uh, workplace triggers, the workplace hazards, that are relevant to uh, MSD development. So we know that cumulative injury uh, actually lowers the threshold for sudden onset injury. So that is, if you've had a number of injuries, you're more susceptible to having an acute event. What uh, in 2012, the International Congress on Occupational Health developed a consensus statement around workplace risk management and what should be our primary goals. And that was, uh, a, um, that, was that we should be focused on reducing musculoskeletal discomfort that is at risk of work, uh, a risk of worsening with work activities and that affects workability or quality of life, not to focus on spe specific diagnoses because this is not particularly relevant to workplace risk management. So I'm suggesting that we need to um, be, be careful because we know that it's often the straw that breaks the camel's back and if we focus all our activities on that, we may be uh, led down uh, the wrong pathway towards identifying what are the key um, hazard and risk factors in the workplace. So are they a problem? In Australia, this is taken from the national data set of serious claims, we know that uh, musculoskeletal disorders, um, uh, injuries and disorders, if we think about them that way, are the largest uh, uh, area of, of claims. And what's interesting in recent years is there's been a shift, uh, say a shift, um, uh, an increased focus on um, stress-related claims or mental health disorders. And if we look at those in comparison to the MSD, we can see that al although they're important, they're a much smaller percentage of overall claims, of course, and there are many reasons for that and not the focus of today's presentation. But in terms of uh, workplace focus, uh, musculoskeletal disorders are an important issue. The issue around um, mental health disorders are that they are very complex uh, and very um, expensive uh, to manage because the, there are significant challenges in getting people um, back to work. So it's not to say they're not important, but by and large, uh, mu uh, musculoskeletal disorders form a greater percentage um, of injuries. So they're not only a problem in Australia, they're a problem in Europe. Um, and a problem worldwide. We know that data is lacking in many developing countries and so it's hard to make um, reasonable comparisons. Um, but a huge percentage of all back pain um, is uh, a significant percentage, I should say. 37% of all back pain is attributable to work. So it's a significant, uh, significant issue. So I'm going to take you through the research evidence on, on MSD causes and the requirements for effective interventions because they should be linked, of course. In 1995, Karinka and Fortier developed uh, this model and I use this model not because I haven't updated my slides but because it uh, shows that we've been thinking about the role of work-related factors for a long time now. And so if we look at this model, we can see that there are a number of, of features some of the, um, uh, in the bottom of the figure, uh, including um, the traditional physical factors, 
and then a whole range of other organisation and psychosocial work uh, variables, such as invariability, um, such as uh, supervision, such as cognitive demands, um, and a range of other factors. And we see that these workplace features and, and so-called generic risk factors, and we may choose to relabel those now given evidence we have, but essentially workplace features, which impacts the pathophysiology. And we can see that within that, um, we see we, uh, these exposure to these factors uh, trigger a stress response. So we get a change in um, endocrine and a hormone and an immune um, system response. Uh, how we cope with that at an individual level, of course, uh, varies, but we get changes in tissue load with resulting mechanical, metabolic and, and biomechanical responses. These then increase the risk of, of uh, development of musculoskeletal disorders, which we know has a resulting impact on health uh, and performance. If we move forward to 2001, many of you will have seen this particular model. Um, uh, it's, it's now, um, you know, one of, I'd say, one of the most well-known models in the area of musculoskeletal disorders. <clears throat> and it's particularly significant for a number of reasons. One is that it's out of America, which have, um, uh, it was developed as part of, a, uh, by an expert panel, which came together and reviewed, uh, a huge body of evidence <clears throat> around the development of musculoskeletal disorders and <clears throat> came up with a number of um, uh, findings uh, and this model. Now there's been strong resistance to um, the recognition of psychosocial factors in the role of um, musculoskeletal disorders and in, the fact, in, in fact that of work-related factors, not just psychosocial. So it was very uh, significant and one that you will see in you know, much of the literature around musculoskeletal disorders. But essentially, building on that previous model, showing that psychosocial hazards, manual handling hazards, or the physical hazards, as we know, impact on the person. We see those physiological changes impacting on um, in having uh, internal tolerances and then resulting in outcomes such as pain and discomfort uh, or musculoskeletal disorders. Of course, there are individual factors but these are largely outside the control of workplaces. We know that we can't control age or gender or people's um, you know, personality types. So these are factors that we, um, uh, we may have to manage in workplaces, but they're not things within our direct uh, control. And then this uh, simplified version out of our research here at uh, La Trobe University, where we've looked at um, uh, a range of evidence and undertaken um, a number of different studies uh, and uh, just looking, we're interested in match between um, uh, individuals and, and their workplace and, and when we get a, a, an imbalance between those, we get uh, these resultant effects within persons, high, high biomechanical loads, uh, fatigue, reduced internal tolerance, tolerance and a stress response resulting in tissue damage uh, and or pain. So this starts to uh, point us towards areas that we should be thinking about in terms of prevention activities. So when we think about types of workplace hazards, we think broadly about manual handling hazards, so task specific, physical hazards, psychosocial hazards, and we think about these as two subgroups, organisational, uh, such as around the work organisation and job design, social context around the sort of support, communication, relationships with managers that we have. More specifically, looking at the um, subgroups of psychosocial hazards, uh, things around the organisational level are things like working hours, shift design, workloads, uh, and you could read the rest on the list there. Um, interesting about conflicting work demands, this is a you know, increasing issue for people, uh, particularly as organisations um, downsize, uh, to put it um, nicely, trying to do uh, more with less. Uh, and then there are the social context uh, hazards, 
around the communication, the general culture of the organisation and individual relationships with co colleagues and supervisors. Important to note that the organisational hazards are the responsibility of managers and supervisors because they, they're involved in the design of work, the allocation of work, and there's overlap um, because they also um, are in a position of being able to control those as well. So they may well be the instigators of some of those problems, um, but they have within their uh, remit the ability to control those. So the really critical thing I, I hope that you take from looking at those models is that increased risk of MSD is determined by a whole range of hazards uh, organisations, psychosocial and the more traditional physical um, ones. We don't necessarily, I think the important thing is that we often don't see that one group or the other uh, result in, um, in injury, but it's usually a combination of factors. Many of these interact or they're, they're additive. If you have one, then the other one becomes worse. However, um, there is still a perception, I think, um, and that manual handle manual handling hazards are the real problem. So even though we've got these psychosocial issues, if we just focus on the manual handling ones, then we should be able to solve the issue. So let's have a look at that further. Bill Maris in 2009, um, he is a, bi a, a biomechanical persuasion. So he's very interested in the physical factors, um, particularly around back pain. And so uh, we, I particularly like using his work because this is someone who, you, who traditionally would think that uh, physical factors are the most important. And so he reviewed, uh, he, and colleagues reviewed a, a range of epidemiological evidence and reported on the contribution of workplace factors to MSD development. And what, uh, what they found was that in terms of development of low back, physical factors contributed somewhere between 11 and 80% to the um, uh, to the explanation of why people developed back pain and psychosocial factors somewhere between 14 and 63 percent. Similar percentages for upper extremity. Now you might say, goodness, that's a really large variation uh, in contributing factors. What does that mean? Well, if you think about what workplaces are and the sorts of measures that are used in the studies that they reviewed, then it's totally explainable. Workplaces are messy, challenging places to collect data. Anyone that's tried to do workplace surveys and get you know, really good response rates will know that it's very challenging. But um, also that they're very different. So what's important in one workplace may not be so important in the other. And I think the key message there is that physical factors and psychosocial factors are both contributing significantly to the development of physical pres presentations such as low back and upper extremity. So um, Johnson looked at uh, retail material handlers and I particularly like this review because um, it, uh, sorry, this study because it's got a very strong uh, design, um, big population and a very physically orientated job. So what do we find here in terms of contribution or predictors of new back pain? That is which factors, which psychosocial habits are more likely to result in the development of um, reports of new back pain. And we can see there that high job intensity is the, um, uh, has the strongest predictive um, contribution to the development of back pain. So that's job intensity, then scheduling demands, job uh, dissatisfaction. So what about the physical aspects? Well, there they are down the bottom, lifting 20 pounds at work, usually every day, you can tell this is an American study, um, uh, that's at 1.2. So still significant predictor, but not as strong as the intensity or the scheduling demands um, imposed on people in, in their work. So our research, let's bring it back to, uh, to Australia just to see if we're any, any different. We've looked at um, seven organisations in warehousing, um, hospitals, um, ambulance, and what we've done in each of those is <clears throat> undertaken an employee survey with, um, and uh, taken scores on workplace hazards, physical and psychosocial hazards, hazardous states, so things like stress, fatigue, job satisfaction and workplace balance, and then we take a 
MSD um, score, a discomfort or pain score across a number of body regions, I'll show you here, um, which asks how often have you felt discomfort or pain uh, in the past six months? Uh, and we look at frequency and um, severities. So it's a very uh, comprehensive measure of uh, pain and discomfort. We look at um, a 12 item physical hazards uh, scale and we use a psychosocial measure that has been used um, uh, in a range of other studies, so we didn't uh, develop it, but looks at measures around relationships with management, reward, workload, and those um, psychosocial um, hazards that we saw earlier that, um, that are potential predictors of MSD risk. So what did we find? When we put all those results uh, in the pot and undertook some, uh, some statistical modelling, uh, we were interested in what were the contributions of those particular um, hazards to uh, the increased uh, MSD risk, which um, we use the pain and discomfort score as a proxy. So um, if you've got uh, higher scores of uh, pain and discomfort, more likely to go on to develop uh, musculoskeletal disorder. So we find there that physical hazards and psychosocial hazards um, contribute very similar amounts. These figures here on the arrows are the amount of contribution those factors are making to the outcome, which is increased uh, MSD risk. We can see there that physical and psychosocial hazards are contributing very similar amounts. Uh, job satisfaction also significant. Uh, the reason it's negative is because low job satisfaction results in increased MSD risk. So that's telling you that um, if you were to focus your um, uh, prevention activities on one or the other groups of hazards, you're missing a large chunk, a large piece of um, the important uh, factors uh, in predicting increased MSD risk. So I think the important thing is that yes, there is variability between studies in their relative importance, but I would suggest that that is totally explainable by those reasons I outlined before, that workplaces aren't nice clinical environments to take measurements and they're all very, very different. So it's hard to, um, you wouldn't expect to get similarities, but what, uh, what is significant there is that we are saying that the importance of both psychosocial and physical hazards in the development of MSDs. So in terms of workplace practice, implications for MSD risk management, because that's what most of us are really interested in is what in a workplace, what does this mean? It means that it's clear that assessment and management of psychosocial hazards is essential. This is not optional. And if we choose to ignore uh, the psychosocial hazards, then we're probably, we'll, there's no doubt that we'll get some improvement, but we may not get the, uh, the full improvement or full reduction um, in MSD risk that we need. The severity of exposure to any single hazard is not necessarily a good indicator of overall MSD risk. So we need to look at multifactorial ways of both identifying and then controlling uh, MSD risk. And a number of the tools, the output of the tools for assessing adverse postures and or biomechanical loads indicate the severity, but it doesn't necessarily indicate overall MSD risk. So it's really important that we don't just look at particular aspects of people's job because we don't necessarily know whether that's the most important part which um, is, causing, uh, is causing the problems. Most, many times we actually focus on single aspects of people's work rather than their overall job. And I think that's an important um, distinction and one that we argue in, in that particular uh, paper I um, showed earlier. So currently, what do we know about what happens in workplace practices? Well, one of the issues is, is that there's little published evidence of actual practices. Um, but mostly what we know from the work that we've done is that there is a strong focus on physical hazards um, and there's not a lot of evidence to support the management of psychosocial hazards in relation to MSDs. And we're currently undertaking a project where we're actually 
um, identify, we're, we're actually interviewing a whole range of um, managers, supervisors, health and safety reps in workplaces to ask them about current um, uh, practices in their workplace and then reviewing their documentation around those um, uh, around the management of um, musculoskeletal disorders and mental health disorders in order to address uh, this, uh, this evidence gap. There are some other examples um, you know, of, of reports uh, and we have undertaken routinely in our work we have a look at um, MSD risk management practices um, uh, to identify what the, what the coverage is of, um, of all hazard and risk factors in relation to MSD. So what do we need to do in terms of um, bridging this gap between research evidence and practice? At La Trobe, we're currently developing um, a toolkit which will enable a comprehensive approach to the risk management of MSD because for all the reasons I've just outlined, the current MSD risk management strategies don't reflect the research evidence as depicted in those frameworks from our model and others um, uh, in, real world, uh, in real world practice. There are a number of barriers to more effective of MSD risk management one is that there is a, um, uh, the, the approach is usually focused on, um, on physical hazards because they're um, often more explainable or, or um, uh, traditionally better understood in workplaces um, compared to uh, the role of psychosocial factors in MSDs. The other, um, the other um, major problem is the concept of a hazard focuses attention on a single event or an object is the problem, instead of in, uh, looking at several interacting agents or events. So taking a really multifactorial approach to the identification and management of hazard and risk factors. Psychosocial factors um, often cause people to uh, run away and say, well, how do I actually manage those? Because they're less um, concrete, harder to touch, than the traditional physical factors. We're very comfortable with lifting, pushing, pulling, but things like um, uh, relationships with colleagues, um, supervisor support, job design, uh, people traditionally say that these are more difficult to measure and then develop approach. They are challenging, there's, there's no question about that, but one of the issues is that we don't necessarily measure them very well the hazard is not necessarily proximal to the outcome um, and this perception, as I just said. But we do need to find a way to assess and control these hazards in the same way that we do with any other OHS hazard. Chemicals, noise, lighting, physical hazards. Um, we need to measure them uh, and then look at those measures and develop con risk management control plans as we do with all of those other hazards. So in terms of um, a risk management toolkit, where are we at in terms of that? Um, the uh, MSD's risk management toolkit needs to uh, comprehensively address all um, hazards. It needs to target risk management at job level, so we need to incorporate all those factors in people's work, just not individual tasks. We've undertaken um, a number of workshops uh, in organisations where we involved a whole range of pe um, people using results from um, studies that I was uh, alluded to before. Um, and this enabled us to identify a, a number of cost effective interventions based on um, results from the survey. But we need um, a toolkit uh, to ensure that this is able to be done by workplaces on their own. It is a documented strategy for applying practical tools to support workplace changes to, um, to control. So a specific risk, MSDs, and a number of hazards uh, such as the physical and psychosocial hazards that we've been talking about. And most of us will be very comfortable with, with what the definitions of those words, hazard, the inherent potential to cause harm, and risk relates to, to a harmful outcome stemming from exposure to one or more hazards. So probability and severity of harm. 
This is an overview of the toolkit process. It very much fits in with a standard risk management approach. It's not meant to be an add-on. This is one of the issues in terms of NST prevention. It often sits um, as, a, as an extra activity rather than being embedded in normal overall risk management processes. So it involves um, having a risk management team, getting all the data together on MSDs, educating the management and supervisors. So ensuring that they're up to speed with what is contemporary evidence on development of musculoskeletal disorders. So bridging that gap between um, introducing that concept of the role of, of psychosocial factors in MSDs. Uh, using the hazard and risk survey, which I outlined before, to survey staff. This enables a, a, a hazard and risk profile to be developed um, and uh, then subsequent to that risk management, uh, sorry, risk controls, implementation and review. So very standard practices. The key difference here is bringing together or providing tools to workplaces to enable them to uh, simply measure uh, a range of hazard and risk factors that are relevant to musculoskeletal disorders. As I said before, that toolkit process very much fits in this framework which we're all um, very comfortable with. Key requirement for the WHO is that these toolkits are practical and easy to use but they provide guidance material so that all workplaces can implement them um, by themselves, uh, that they're applicable in most settings, be cost effective, so very much it needs to be embedded in current processes, not the new ones developed, um, and it assists them to work through the full risk management cycle um, in accord with the WHO uh, healthy workplace model. I don't have time in this particular presentation to go through that, but that's one of the requirements of risk management toolkits. Um, for, uh, by the WHO. So currently we're testing. Uh, we are in the, in the um, we're undertaking um, a, an intervention um, project in the aged care sector to customise the toolkit and then test it, um, uh, test out its uh, usability within workplaces. And the intention is that it's interactive and it allows users to customise further into into workplace data to obtain guidance on risk control um, options and we'll be looking for opportunities to implement, evaluate and compare data across different sectors um, in future stages of the project. And this is a key question, to what extent is customisation needed for different jobs um, and, and sectors? And so how uh, would the toolkit uh, look so that workplaces are able to, uh, to do that? So back to the three questions. I hope that uh, following this presentation, and probably because you're here listening to this, you recognise that MSDs are a problem, um, and one of the um, my, you know one of the most significant OHS problems we need to manage uh, in workplaces. What does the evidence tell us about it? Musculoskeletal disorders. Uh, the evidence is telling us very clearly that um, it's these are complex problems that require. Um, identification of all has relevant hazards uh, and risk factors in the workplace in order to be able to develop effective comprehensive strategies to manage um, musculoskeletal disorders and are there gaps in current strategies used to manage MSDs and I would suggest and I hope you agree that um, in evaluating uh, the, the evidence um, and in uh, interviewing uh, uh, a whole range of people in different sectors, I would suggest that there are gaps in current strategies to use to manage MSDs and that we need to be thinking about how we're actually going to address that if we're going to significantly improve uh, the current problems in relation to, uh, to MSDs. So, the take home message is that there are, I think there are three key points to consider in your own workplaces. Does your organisation's current policies and procedures reflect contemporary evidence relating to musculoskeletal disorders? And perhaps have a look and think about whether or not these are, and I, I um, 
digress a little bit here, that policies and procedures are really only the first part of um, you know, effective risk management. But um, if these are not encouraging us to think broadly about this problem, then we may want to rethink uh, those policies and procedures. Don't step away from the management of psychosocial hazards. It's difficult, not impossible, but we have to start somewhere. And we know there are other um, uh, there are other areas of, of OHS that we have um, you know, significantly evolved, uh, improved in time how we manage these particular issues. So we do need to um, uh, you know, be brave and, and take steps forward in the management of psychosocial hazards. And strong leadership is pivotal. We need to have support in making changes happen and in, in um, reshaping the way we think about musculoskeletal disorders. So, I'm um, going to draw the first bit of um, this seminar uh, to a close, but if you're interested in learning more, uh, we will be running a short course in early next year uh, in health and design of work. How do we design work to prevent MSDs and improve health and wellbeing? And if uh, you're interested in, in taking a big step into um, a further education, and the link there will take you through to our, our, our courses at uh, La Trobe University. There's the references. And there are a number of resources uh, available online uh, to support um, effective management of uh, musculoskeletal disorders uh, and stress at work. And these can be found here. And uh, I'll leave someone else to talk about that. But I'd also like to say that we, have a, we, we currently have a number of projects where we're seeking um, uh, participation by organisations and so we're always willing to talk to people um, about uh, how we might be able to involve um, your organisation in our, in our current projects or future projects. So uh, my contact details are, are at the end of this presentation. So thank you and I'll hand over to Alicia for um, uh, to start the questions rolling. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Oakman. Um, I guess it's just good to note that we didn't have a single participant drop off through the whole entirety of that presentation, which I think is an excellent indication of how relevant the content you've delivered today is for our stakeholders. So thank you again for that. As Dr. Oakman um, referred to just previously, there are many reference studies throughout this presentation. So a list of those resources and references will be included in the presentation that we circulate to all participants following today's webinar. So we have shot your questions through to Dr. Oakman. So we will just give her a minute just to read over those. But while she is doing that, I would just quickly mention that we have the final webinar for this MSD's virtual series, which is being held on the 17th of November. So it's not too far away. In this particular webinar, we have Juliet Maynard, who's the National Workplace Health and Safety and Injury Management Advisor. And she'll be focusing on the enablers for success for the CSR Limited Manual handling oh, manually manual handling project sorry so registrations for that particular webinar is open so secure your spot as it is the last one for this particular series okay if dr. Oakman's ready I'll hand back to you and she can work through the questions and thank you so much to those participants who have actually shot through questions um, dr. Oakman over to you thank you Elise. So the first question here is, uh, what is the best way to identify and measure psychosocial hazards? Um, and I've got another question that's very similar to that around, are there any standardised surveys that can be used with employees to assess physical and psychosocial hazards? Um, there are, the, the, the best way uh, with psychosocial hazards is, is through self-report, because obviously how uh, it's very difficult to uh, objectively measure some of these, um, you know, these, these hazards around um, social, you know, uh, support at work, um, uh, autonomy and control. So these things need to be done by self-report. There are a whole range of tools and one of the websites that um, was provided a couple of slides back, the Stress at Work um, uh, link there um, has a number of measures. Um, 
uh, on that website for the number of, of resources. As I said, we use um, a work organisation assessment questionnaire, which is um, which is referenced uh, somewhere in the, there you go, there's the occupational stress of people at work. So there we, there's a number of uh, measures on that in terms of psychosocial hazards. I think one of the key things uh, with psychosocial hazards and with physical hazards, that we don't collect regular data of our employees routinely. Um, and so we don't have good indicators of what are the problems and where are the problems. And so I think one of the key things is if, to embark on, on um, really identifying these is that you need to take some measures over a period of time. So you need to commit to you know, taking some annual measures so that you can actually see what the issues are, input, developing and implementing the controls, and then re-evaluating what the impact of those are. So the next question is, um, is Jody still looking for workplaces to participate in their studies and psychosexual factors in workplaces? Uh, and that particular person who noted the, the, the question, uh, yes, please email me and we can um, discuss that further. Um, and thank you, there's my um, uh, contact details. And that was all the, the questions that came through. So maybe I'll hand it uh, and we can go. Hi Jodie, um, we do actually have a couple more if that's okay. So I might just pitch some at you. Um, one of the ones we have is where can we find further information to assist with the management of psychosocial issues? Um, but I think you've kind of touched on that one already, so I might just skip over to the next. Um, one particular participant has said, does any of the evidence or the studies discuss or include fatigue as a contributing factor to MSDs? Um, it's an interesting area for HSSC and uh, fly in, fly out workers. So do you have any comments on that particular industry? Um, perhaps if I go broader than that, the contribution of um, uh, fatigue and actually not on these slides here, I don't think. Um, but uh, the role of, uh, yes, in, in we, we would consider that fatigue is what we call an intermediate state. So it's, uh, in itself is, is not uh, the problem because uh, one of the issues with, with fatigue is that it often gets confused in terms of whether it's a predictor or an outcome. Um, we would consider that it's, a, it's, it's one of those, it's a, a personal state so that uh, it arises as exposure to work, it's actually a good thing because if we went to work all day and we weren't fatigued, maybe that we're doing so much. But one of the issues is that in that particular state, we are more likely to make um, perhaps decisions uh, that aren't sensible. We're more likely to have, um, you know, we're, we're more likely to have. Um, um, uh, fatigue in terms of um, muscles uh, and the other structures are around that, so we're at increased risk because of, of that. Um, and so the issue there is that it predisposes us to increased MSD risk. Um, and there are a number of models that if you look at in terms of MSD development will have fatigue um, slotted in there. Now in terms of particular industries, we know that, um, for example, I, I think the question was about fly in, fly out, that there are particular issues around there, around the way that the work is constructed, i.e. The, the hazard is around the organisation of the work, results in people you know, being fatigued, particularly when they're working for really quite long hours and long, long, um, a number of days in a row without a break, that they are then, by virtue of that, uh, at increased risk of MSD development. I hope that uh, that answers that. Um, there is uh, in, in in the MSD literature around what are um, psychosocial and physical factors, or what are in general workplace factors. You'll find um, fatigue included in those models. Thank you for that, Jody. Um, if I can just quickly squeeze in one more, because I am mindful of the time. Um, 
In terms of the psychosocial risk assessments themselves, do you have any advice or sort of, um, I guess, preference? Should they be completed by HR or the safety department? Do you have any opinion or comment on that? Okay, yes, and, and, and actually um, I, I do. And one of the things that uh, I didn't get to emphasise enough uh, in that presentation is that this, that MS, this process, the toolkit process I was talking about, is, is very participative. And we know that the evidence um, supports the participative approach and that we have much better uptake and implementation of processes um, and prevention activities when um, participation is, is, is high. So um, in terms of uh, the survey completion, I think, and, and Alicia, you may need to correct me if I've misinterpreted that, but um, employees should be uh, completing uh, the, the surveys anonymously, of course, because if they're not anonymous, then they're less likely, people are less likely to be honest about uh, the particular um, issues at hand. So if I take uh, the approach that we use in terms of the, the toolkit, the, the employees in um, particular jobs that uh, are being um, um, assessed would fill in um, surveys uh, and those would be uh, anonymous. The uh, risk management team or, um, uh, would arrange for those to be input into the uh, database, the, or the ex at the moment it's an Excel uh, database program, and this would then generate what were the particular risk factors um, that needed to be addressed, or the areas I should say, uh, and then the controls need to be developed uh, participatively with that risk management team, which comprises um, uh, of reps at different levels, but importantly, uh, employee reps, health and safety reps. Did that address the question? Yeah, no, I think that's great and I kind of agree with that approach. As a bit of a follow-on question we have, um, if a control is not followed, do you think that HR or safety should be the department disciplining for the non-conformance? Because I think a few of our participants are sort of finding that it's a bit of a grey area and a bit of an uncertainty. So do you have any um, preference or I guess advice in regards to that particular issue? That is a very challenging question uh, and I think um, not to dodge the question at all but I think it really depends on the organisation and how the work is organised because the primary responsibility actually is with um, uh, the supervisor in charge of the work uh, and if that's not working then it would be escalated according to the processes within the organisation. Now OHS usually sits within HR, I mean there are many um, iterations to that, but I, so I should say often, often sits in HR. Um, but uh, my preference would be for it not to get to that, but it does need to go to the supervisor first uh, and then um, whoever, whatever the, it, it would depend also on the severity or the implications for um, not adhering to that particular risk control. So it is difficult to answer that specifically, um, but I think it needs to be uh, thought through about how you deal with non-compliance um, in your particular organisation because that will differ, you know, depending on the organisation, the size of the organisation and the structure. Yeah, absolutely. I guess it just enforces that. There is no sort of um, cookie cutter or one size fits all oh, sort absolutely. of approach to these types of issues. That is the key, you know, there are, there are I think, two key messages. One is there isn't a uniform and um, participation is vital. Super. Well, thank you so much. I do recognise that there are a few questions that we didn't get a chance to get to, but I am mindful of time. So I will have to wrap up the webinar for today now. If you do have a question or you think of something later, um, Dr Oakman has been kind enough to share her email address which is on the screen now or alternatively we're always here so feel free to email wcr.education at justice.qrd.gov.au and we can um, work with Dr Oakman to get a response out to you as well just to make sure that your concerns are addressed. So on behalf of the 
Workers' Compensation Regulator and Workplace Health and Safety Queensland and Dr Oakman, thank you so much for participating in today's session. We value your feedback incredibly and we really are reliant on what you guys tell us you want. So if you have two minutes, we'll shoot you through to a quick survey and we'd love for you to fill out and let us know what you do want um, in the coming months and particularly for 2016. So thank you so much. We'll talk to you soon and have a great afternoon. Thank you.